the main thing is that you want to have bacteria that eat things that the host is unable to eat. So if you take humans, for example, and pigs probably are the same, um, they need to eat fiber. And then the fiber is eaten by uh, microbial communities, and that's what maintains a healthy microbiome. So when, so let's say that you increase the amount of protein, you lower the amount of fiber, then you get differences in populations. And that's when um, you have, let's say, undesirable players um, that proliferate and become more prominent. So that would be a state of dysbiosis. Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, where we explore the science behind, behind Swine Nutrition. I'm your host, Jorge Estrada. Today in our podcast, we have Dr. Benoit Sampier, who is an associate professor at South Dakota University. We will be discussing the microbiome of livestock animal and the impact on production. Dr. Sampier, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you, Dr. Estrada. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, before we dive into today's topic about the microbiome, could you please give a quick introduction of yourself? Sure. I was born in uh, Quebec in Canada, did all of my schooling until master's um, all in French. Um, and then I did my PhD at the University of Toronto in cancer research. And after that, I moved to Burlington, Vermont to work in plant molecular genetics And then since I always need changes in my professional life, I guess, I switched over to uh, microbiome of food animals. And a few years later, I was able to get a position at South Dakota State University. And here I am 10 years later. Excellent. Well, again, it's, it's great having you today here. So microbiome, a hot topic, one, one that is hard to digest for a lot of us. So uh, let's start with something. Uh, that sounds simple, but it's not. Uh, how do gut microbiomes, how do they work? Well, they, um, they consist of uh, metabolic specialists, which means that every species has a specific role or has a limited number of things that it can do. And it's only if they work together that they can thrive as a community. And typically, if we're talking in terms of a healthy microbiome, that would be a community that would eat things that the host is unable to eat. And that's, that keeps both parties um, nice and uh, in, in good harmony. Um, and then when things start to go bad is when um, the microbiome starts eating things that the host can also eat. Um, and then that's when you can get um, dysbiosis or disease state. Excellent. And I'd like to circle back a little bit on, 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 on the healthy piece that you just mentioned, because, you know, we <laughs> widely use like, you know, gut health and all, you know, those are terms that are used out there in a lot of the marketing piece. But uh, with an expert like you, maybe we can dig a little bit more into the definition of what a healthy gut microbiome should look like or what does it mean? Well, it, it's really hard to define because there are a lot of players that we know nothing about. Um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the main thing is that you want to have bacteria that eat things that the host is unable to eat. So if you take humans, for example, and pigs probably are the same, um, they need to eat fiber. And then the fiber is eaten by uh, microbial communities, and that's what maintains a healthy microbiome. So when, so let's say that you increase the amount of protein, you lower the amount of fiber, then you get differences in populations. And that's when um, you have, let's say, undesirable players um, that proliferate and become more prominent. So that would be a state of dysbiosis, for example. And in some cases, it can also be induced by the host. Um, if you have inflammation in the gut, for example, then that can create substrates that pathogens like E. coli or salmonella can use. And that's when um, these bad players can also proliferate. Excellent. And of course, for us that, you know, would like to learn more about this topic, um, 
out there, there are some misconceptions about, you know, what, what the microbiome is, um, how does it show, what are some of those common misconceptions about the, you know, gut microbiomes and, and how the, the gut microbiome work? Well, probably the, the biggest misconception is that all bacteria are created equal. Um, and that's really prevalent, or I would say prominent in the, in the field of probiotics because you have bacteria that are uh, created as probiotics that don't really belong in the environment where they're meant to function. Uh, there's some that are soil bacteria, for example. Um, so if you think of the microbiome, think of a wide range of specialists. Uh, one comparison would be um, we all have cell phones and then we have apps that are in common and we have apps that are different. So you can think of a community of bacteria or microorganisms in, in the microbiome as being many different cell phones that have some common features, but a lot of very specific ones. And it's by having complementary functions that they're able to to, to, to thrive and accomplish their functions, essentially. Excellent. And let me let me take this to maybe to a different level. And, and you know, we're going to, at least this way, we, we can use your expertise a little bit better in the sense that you have worked with other species as well when it comes down to the microbiome piece. And then, you know, this podcast is about, is about swine. What, you know, I mean, with your experience and working with other, other species, maybe can you point a little bit, you know, what's the difference of, of, of something that is quite interesting in, with the other uh, species that you have been working with versus uh, pigs? Probably, I would, well, I can't say that there's something specific. I, the biggest challenge right now is that um, if we look at the genome of any or most bacterial species, particularly in the gut, at least half of the genes, we have no idea what their function is. Um, we find common pathways between, let's say, rumen bacteria and bacteria in the, in the hind gut of a pig. And these would be, for example, to metabolize glucose into short chain fatty acids, like acetate, propionate, and butyrate. So these are pretty standard. But what probably makes the difference between um, the species in these different environments is are, are all these other genes that we have no idea what they're doing. And I would say that that's probably the, the biggest challenge that we're facing right now because with the tools that we use, um, we're only able to say, well, it's doing this particular function. And for all the other genes that we don't know what they're doing, we just say, well, they're hypothetical, but then that's not very helpful in trying to understand how the system works. So I would say that that's probably the biggest challenge that we're facing um, for the next little while. Well, we're looking forward to learn more, right? Because this is definitely an area that is catching a lot of attention and we're hoping to, to see how the application of it, you know, works for all of us in the industry. Dr. Saint-Pierre, we really thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, I'm glad to come back if you ever need to. Of course, everyone, thanks for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us some good comments. Join us in our next episode.